So the showrunners of Andor claim that it would change our viewing of Rogue One. Well, today we put that statement to the test because we rewatched Rogue One. So let's get into it. Time to hit that intro. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one, zero, all engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. 32 minutes. All right, everybody, if it's your first time joining us, welcome. We're two dads who love all things Phantom, from Star Wars to Star Trek, Marvel to DC, and Middle Earth on down to Westeros. We love it all, and we want to bring all of our insights and love of all things nerdy to you, our viewers. So if that's your cup of blue milk, then we're here for you, and you should definitely subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on all of our amazing reviews and insights that we bring to all of our favorite fandoms. So thanks for tuning in, guys. My name is Chris Matthews, and I'm joined, as always, by the scruffy-looking nerf herder himself, Mr. Matt Parham, how are you doing today, brother? I am doing brilliantly, and i got to say, I had not watched this movie in such a long time, and uh, it was so great, so great to to revisit. I'm very excited about today's episode. I got to say, yeah, it was an absolute treat getting to watch it again. I'm I'm really looking forward to this talk with you, brother. And just right now, I want to throw down the gauntlet. We we watched all of season one of Andor. We've covered it here on Fatherly Fandom. And you guys can check that out. We got a playlist on that. And all those episodes are in our back catalog. But are you game for doing this again after Andor season two? Oh, yeah. I, I'm probably awesome. going to rewatch awesome. Rogue One. Later yeah. this week. <laughs> <laughs> and let's just dive into it. So, as always, guys, I like to pull up that old Rotten tomato score. So, once again, we got 84% from the critics. 462 critics altogether have rated this movie. And audience score, uh, we have a huge sample size here. I love this. If, if your sample size is over 2,000, it's a pretty good sample size. This yeah. one's over 100,000. So, <laughs> You can be pretty (laughs) sure that the the viewing audience out there is is pretty confident with this score. And that score is an 86% altogether out of 100,000 ratings, which is really cool. 100,000 plus actually is what it says. So it's probably even more than. And you got to consider that. I'm 100,000 people took the time to go online and review this thing, not Mm -hmm. anonymously comment in a, uh, you know, a comment section of uh, some website. I mean, actually log in, write something, and uh, have it come up in all that uh, <laughs> that mm-hmm. sample size, like we were saying, for the overall rating. So that is incredibly impressive. That is very impressive. So it's really cool. So let's get into it. This this movie was directed by Gareth Edwards. Before this, he did Godzilla, the, the recent Woo! one. Um, and the, the, there's a lot of controversy behind this one. Do, have you heard about all this controversy behind the filming and production of Rogue One? Oh, there's lots of stuff that I would love to get in with this, but mm-hmm. I'll I'll let you go ahead and comment on the the controversy. I'll I'll take some of the trivia. Yeah. So just I'm just going to be general with this. Yeah, we could we could go on talking about this movie (laughs) and the things that happened behind the scenes. And I hope one day we get the full story about what exactly happened in the documentary on how they made this movie. But Gareth Edwards was brought on to direct the film and everything here. They had the film done. And afterwards, the studio decided to go back and kind of retool things. So that's when Tony Gilroy was actually brought on board. So Chris White did the screenplay originally for Rogue One. So he was hired to develop the story and everything like that. Tony Gilroy, the showrunner for Andor, actually came on pretty late in the game. Like the release was coming up and then he came on board. And they went back and post-production and fixed a ton of stuff. So they say a lot of the inside industry says that this movie was saved post-production because mm-hmm. we got these guys that are really into Star Wars that obviously love Star Wars, produced an amazing film. 
And then you have somebody go over it with a critical eye like Tony Gilroy, and it just brought it beyond of what it could have been. And it tightened Absolutely. everything up, shored up the problems that we had. And we saw this a lot too. In like, if you watch the trailer for this before, you saw it when it came out in what, 2016? Oh my gosh, it was six years ago. Can't believe that. It's crazy. <laughs> but if you watch that trailer, there's a lot of scenes in there that are different than what we got in the movie. And I remember that was a big question for me. And I kind of, kind of took me on, I, out. Yeah. I remember it was a question for me yeah. as well, because I actually did catch the trailer for this. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in the theaters and it was in front of some other film. Um, so, you know, I don't usually like to engage in a lot of the marketing stuff, but I saw this. He doesn't. Matt hates and, those trailers. <laughs> um, yeah. So it looked interesting just from that. And then mm -hmm. when we got to the film, it was great because all of the stuff that I was anticipating, I didn't see much of. So That's true. marketing worked for me finally. <laughs> <laughs> so for Matt, this was the best trailer ever. Basically, what they should do is come out with a trailer with none of the material in the movie uh, and just advertise the movie. Matt would love it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, awesome. I don't know why they really need to market these yeah. IP things anyway. I mean, you've got the audience True. built in. There, Anybody mm -hmm. that posts something online that says, hey, Iron Man 4 is coming out July 4th, 2023. The theaters are going to be filled. Doesn't right. matter what. If they just have a black screen that says that, all the marketing that you need. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so out of all the sequels and everything else, Solo, Rogue One is by far beyond my favorite of the new stuff that we've gotten here. Absolutely. It's the closest to what I think we got in the original Star Wars. It's literally, it's minutes away from the opening of A New Hope. So, yeah. and the effects with this, this movie were amazing. They used a lot of model work, which I absolutely love. Something that they did in Lord of the Rings. And I was like, they need to apply that to Star Wars. Because, you know, during the prequels, I, I do love the prequels now. I, I'm very much a, a converted fan of the prequels. Wasn't into them at the time when they came out because I was an O Trilly fan, as we like to say here on, on Fatherly Fandom. We we appreciate the O Trilly, but uh, I've since come aboard with those thanks to Dave Filoni and the Clone Wars. I just thought, man, th these would be so much better. These prequels would have been so much better if we had more practical effects. So that is something that we get to see on full display here in all of its glory with Rogue One. And there's so many elements to see acting, the, the cinematography, but the effects, the model work, everything just reigns true. The Grand Moff Tarkin, as we oh, see yeah. him in here, still kind of holds up for me. I, I don't feel that that is, is the, that the effect. Peter Cushing's? Yes, the late right. Peter Cushing. Um, they brought him back through CGI and everything. Uh, so they, at this point in time, they didn't have deep fake and everything. And they vastly improved on that, especially with Luke Skywalker and the book of Boba Fett. But even yeah. with Tarkin in this, I, I wasn't thrown out as much. Now, at the end of the movie, when we see Leia, I still kind of am thrown out of it. And it, there is that, that sense of uncanny valley with that where it doesn't look quite right to me still. Yeah. But with Tarkin, I remember being there in the theater watching this movie and gasping having Tarkin come up on the screen in this film because it looked so good and I yeah. still stick to that I think it still does so all all the artists that actually worked on that character the stand-in as well uh did an incredible job with that just brilliantly I, done I always wonder you know my kids haven't seen this one but I wonder if I showed it to them if they really have any idea mm -hmm. that this was not original Leia. This was not original Tarkin. Or yeah. it would just seem like yet another scene for them. Mm -hmm. You know, we know it because we know that there's been a length of time between filming these movies. So it can't possibly be those people. But right. for the unaware, even some of my friends that have not ever seen Star Wars, I, I do wonder if you showed them these movies in order with the original trilogy <laughs> if if they'd quite realize before seeing a new hope that those were de-aged digitally recreated people yeah i don't know yeah that would be a fun experiment so i wanted to take us into uh how this movie related to andor that's why we're here that's why we're revisiting rogue one as well and a lot of the criticism that we get from star wars fans is that 
Andor was boring. It was too slow. It didn't involve a lot of uh, the other main characters. We didn't have a lot of action, no lightsabers, no mention of the Force, things like that. And uh, in this movie, we get a lot of those things. And I kind of realized after the fact how much those things actually do mean to me in Star Wars. And it was all so cohesively put together and beautifully done. And so there, there's an element in this movie that we actually didn't get with Andor. But I say this, and I say but, there's a caveat here. I think that that is where season two is going to lead with Andor. It was a slow burn for the first season of Andor, and it's setting up all these pieces that are going to culminate in something that we're more familiar with. So all you fans out there that did have a problem with Andor season one, I think are going to definitely be on board for season two. We're going to get K2SO, which... Oh my God, having that levity during this movie was amazing. And Alan Tudyk, yeah. I've always loved Alan Tudyk, especially from Firefly, if you guys have ever seen it. One of my favorite shows out there. He did a phenomenal job in that. But as K2SO, he brought something to a droid that uh, we really haven't seen. I mean, like you have the kookiness with C-3PO and everything, but those those droids can tend to be annoying. So we we've never had a very personable droid that was just awesome like that i do have to throw in one of my my first bits of trivia here about do it because i i read this and i was like oh man that's hilarious but yeah i'm i'm also a huge fan of uh alan tudyk and everything he's done from a knight's tale to um you know to uh firefly but so i guess are we gonna talk about the slap Yes, he was nice. not the one that improvised that. It was actually Diego Luna that <laughs> improvised the slap uh, in the scene. Alan Tudyk is wearing a, a mocap suit, but then Alan Tudyk and answered, if you want a fresh one, talk yeah, back again by improvising the line. And <laughs> there's a fresh one for you of a mouth off again. <laughs> yeah. so it was perfectly timed and improvised, and uh, I just thought that was great. And if you guys notice, too, in that scene, Diego Luna is covering his mouth, and you can see him cracking up at that point. <laughs> oh, and, and that brings me so much joy in that moment, too. Yeah. That, that's that's the kind of stuff that you get with Alan Tudyk. Back to the Force with this. We, we get an overall sense of the Force, not as just an idea but as a presence in this. And that is something that I feel like we were lacking in Andor, but that, but that idea that, you know, the force, the will of the force is actually a character in rogue one. It definitely feels like that for me. And the whole idea of this rebellion is just going along with the will of the force. And if we can kind of go into it as well, one of the reasons why, why the Jedi failed and the downfall of the Jedi is because they weren't following the will of the force. They were following politicians and the Republic and everything. And they had mandates and they had constrainments and they they had to have a council and agree upon all this stuff instead of following the will of the force. And the one person uh, that brought this up was Qui-Gon Jinn. You know, he was fully on board with that. And that's one of the reasons he wasn't a a master on the council because Mm -hmm. he followed the will of the force and it went against the Jedi order. So we see this group, of rebels, the Rebel Alliance, actually following that to its conclusion. Yeah. Do Do you think that Sharut was meant to be sort Chirrut of an Inway. untrained Jedi? No, I don't believe that he was an untrained Jedi. And what they say in in the story and on Jedha, that is, um, they're the guardians of the wills. And if you guys know anything about um, the the history behind Star Wars, uh, the Journal of the Wills was the original title part of the title for the the saga that George Lucas outlined. And so the wills were supposed to be these deity entities that were looking over, kind of watching this stuff, you know, on a screen of history yeah. playing out beyond the world and what whatnot. And we kind of get the wills in a way in the Clone Wars in, a, in an episode at the end of, I think, season seven uh, with Yoda when he learns from Qui-Gon about how to become a force ghost and things like that. You can check that out later. There's a lot of really cool stuff on that in the wills. And there's, there's copious amounts of material out there that you can read on, but um, no cheer at M way. Um, and this is the idea that I love the most. You do not have to have a high midi chlorian count to be one with the force. I'm one with the force. The force is with me. And the idea that the force works through all living beings. And this is something that George Lucas 
reiterated time and time again during the the original trilogy and he remarked on this later on and a lot of people had problems with the original prequel trilogy um, because of the idea of midichlorians they were like well that means that only a certain select few people can be special right but George Lucas later kind of reiterated the point that, well, that's what the Jedi and, and their society thought at the time. They investigated these midichlorians and they were conduits of the force, but that doesn't necessarily mean that normal people can't use the force or be in tune with the force. So it's this idea that all of us with training and practice and time can elevate ourselves. And this is what we get to see in full display with Chirrut Imwe. And I got to say, Hats off to Donnie Yen. I absolutely Donnie Yen. love Donnie Yen as Cheer Emway. I was so excited when this came out because I am a huge fan of Eatmon and that Eatmon. whole series as well. If you don't know, he was the master of uh, you know Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee was actually taught by Eatmon, and uh, he uh, he was a master in Wing Chun. And that just, those that series is amazing. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Some of the best martial arts I've ever seen on screen. Uh, that it, everybody can learn something from from those films. They're just beautifully done. We get to see him on full display here. He is just a treat to see on screen. No, I always thought that the midi chlorians were an idea that they've been attempting to walk back in mm. some way or another. They can't obviously say that uh, that it's not true or that the you know right. prequels don't matter, but. They never really emphasize mm -hmm. uh, their importance after Phantom Menace right. as they did in that film. So it always just seemed like after that, it, it was, you know, so um, so disliked by the fans and everybody that they, they just tried to stay away from it as much as possible. So, yeah, there was a couple of like and when I was watching this movie, did you find any inconsistencies with Andor, his character specifically in this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He says he's never show. been to prison. <laughs> Big one. Yeah, bingo. That's, a, that's, that's the largest one that I found in here, too. He's like, mm -hmm. it's never happened to me. He kind of offhandedly mentions that when they're captured by Saul as well. And, you know, Chirrut Imwe is like, I believe you take your prison with you, you know, wherever you go and everything. So, um, yeah, that's the big one. And I can kind of write that off. I'm thinking about it myself. I'm like, well... Technically, they didn't have any bars or gates up. They just uh, electrified the floors there on, you know, yeah, on Narkina I mean, 5. But yes, it was a big, like, clearly, mm, yeah, you know, just, uh, overlooked. So I'm like, right, Tony, Tony Gilroy, Gilroy, we got to mark you off on that. Uh, we're going to take a take a grade down from you for, for not uh, catching yeah. that one. It was pretty blatant. Absolutely. Well, also, watching them back to back. Mm -hmm there's a clear age discrepancy true you know, yeah now and then and uh no fault of really anybody uh, there's only so much you can do yeah. with makeup and, and you don't want diego luna yeah. to have to like wander around <laughs> through the entire 12 episode shoot with like sort of de-aging cream all over his face and everything it just right. it's not that big a deal so um but those were the two biggest discrepancies uh, i mean Mm -hmm. I don't know. It, they're, it's going to be interesting to see how they get him from his motivations and his feelings on where he ended up in the end of season one to this, yeah. to this um, casting Andor that we see in Rogue One because he's even kind of berating uh, Jin at a certain point saying, you know, I've been in the Alliance since I was eight years old. No, he says, Clearly. I've been in this fight since I was six years old. So Yeah, yeah, I've been in this fight since I was six years old. But clearly he's had his, you know, reservations mm -hmm. about it. And most stories like this start out the same way with a hero that doesn't want to be a hero. And then you have to give him motivation yep. in order to get there. So we get the same story with Cassian, it turns out. Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, so I'm not sure why he was laying it on thick yeah. with Jen. All of a I sudden. actually, I actually felt that that line actually weighed a lot more after watching Andor, and I believe, like, and I don't think that it's an inconsistency, at least not for me, because yeah. he was picked up as a kid, uh, you know, by Marva Andor, and she she was a separatist. They were part of the separatist 
Um, so they were fighting that war against this 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 system of corruption that eventually became the empire. So in a way, you can yeah. say that he was in that fight, not be, not because he chose to be, but just because of the circumstances that he was thrown into. And so that's what he's actually saying. out of it and take the money and go True, away you? and doesn't want yeah. to do with it. And... Yeah. <laughs> so did Jin Erso, like the same, same type of thing. And that's why these two characters are so beautifully put together in this movie is because he's a seeing a reflection of himself in Jin Erso and bringing out it's... the best of himself. If it had been me in this situation, why, or anybody mm -hmm. really, why wouldn't you say, look, I've been there and had my doubts too and mm -hmm. blah, 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 you know, instead of just saying like, yeah. you're not as committed. <laughs> <laughs> I I really do like what they do with Jen. I like her, yeah. her story. I, me too. I love the fact that this, this story has a point. All yeah. the other star Wars offshoots, uh, shows, films are are there really to take advantage of a marketable character True. or or something along those lines be it with mandalorian solo obi-wan all of that stuff is meant to you know drive money into this industry and this franchise whereas you know this is another star wars film so inherently it's it's built to make money but the story has a purpose. Mm -hmm. The story has a place in the overall scheme of these stories. And like mm -hmm. right from the opening crawl of new hope, there's a story there that yeah. it has yet to be told. So for me, this film always had a point, mm -hmm. it had a reason to be made that was very legitimate and working Jin and her father into that was perfect. It gave a reason for the Death Star being so easily destroyed. Yep. It gave a reason for her enough. to be part of that story and her mm -hmm. dad using, you know, his little pet name for her as the file name. Star All of it just worked so perfectly in yeah. there. And uh and was is to me it didn't seem like just extraneous plot threads that were thinly pulled together. I, I really liked the the taut feeling of this script. Absolutely. Hats off to John Knoll. He's the one that originally came up with this concept. He was reading the scroll for A New Hope in the beginning, the title sequence there, and was like, we yeah. have a movie in there. We, we could make this. So they, they ran with that. John Knoll, has, uh, he's one of the, the digital effects artists and everything from the prequels and everything. He's been on board with Lucasfilm even longer yeah. than that as well. But he's the one that came up with this. So <laughs> great job with there, Mr. Knoll. So I did read The Catalyst. I, I mentioned this in one of my Andor, our Andor videos here. Um, and that's a prequel novel to this movie, which was really okay. cool to get. And it kind of brought some insights into Jin Erso, Galen Erso as well. And it got it, it really helped you understand exactly the headspace that Galen Erso was in, where they came from. And originally, like he's been studying like crystals and he's been, you know, a scientist all of his life. And he's very much one of those people that puts his job first and like thinks of uh, of his career and that's where his life is is in his work and um during the time of the clone wars they actually get captured by the separatists um, because they were on a world that was like kind of neutral or whatnot and they were working mm -hmm. for this corporation they get captured by them and they're they're actually in captivity for a long time and lira actually gets pregnant with Jin while they're uh prisoners poor Jin has been mm -hmm. a prisoner multiple times in her life from birth and everything. And eventually Krennic, uh, Orson Krennic is the one to get them out of that situation. So he came oh. with the Republic and was able to rescue them. So that's where they form that kind of bond. That's where they first met, Ga like, you know, where Orson Krennic met Galen Erso and they developed that, that understanding, that friendship together. So that does bring a whole mm -hmm. nother level in Rogue One, especially in the beginning of this. And, you know, it shows you the rise uh, of Orson Krennic. Let's take a little time to talk a little bit about the Death Star here in, in that book and the things that I've learned. Uh, and I mentioned this also in our Andor video a little bit, but Krennic was um, part of the, the the crew that went over to Geonosis and talked to Pago the Lesser, you know, the, the, the guy that we get to see in Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. Uh, that's on the separatist side and after the second time the second battle of geonosis there were two the one that we see in episode two and then one later on about a year later 
Um, after that, they're they're um, they're held by the Republic and everything. And he convinces Poggle the Lesser to come on board and to start building this battle station for them. So they actually started building the first Death Star during the time of the Republic. So this 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 whole in- enterprise started during that time. So they started building it. That's when Krennic got involved with that. The Geonosians were used heavily in this process. And we, as we see in Andor too, you know, they used uh, prisoners and, and picked up people off the street and drummed up bogus charges so that they could build all these different parts for the for the dish for the Death Star and everything. We see it at the end. And so eventually these Geonosians they uh they all get killed mass uh, mass genocide of this species all of them killed and we get to see this in rebels as well uh the the outskirts of that and um and as we see at the end of of andor you know that one shot of the death star right at the end you know them building it uh, everything i now know that that planet was actually Scarif because in the information that I was able to find is the Death Star was actually moved from Geonosis over to Scarif. So, it, and that makes a lot more sense. And looking at the movie, you know, uh, Krennic had a very familiarity with um, the uh, the places on Scarif. Um, so he would have gone back there all the time. That's why they had the Death Star plans there is because they were building it. They were finishing up the build over that planet. So I do believe that the planet we see at the end of Andor is Scarif. And so that yeah, leads that me to sense. believe, yeah, right? Yeah. So that leads me to believe that Orson Krennic is going to show up in the next season of Andor. What do you think? I think that would be great. And if they yeah. got Ben Mendelsohn back, Please. I mean, what a pleasure. You know, Dude, he's not get out off. of the park here. I, I really love how we've seen <clears throat> him in other things. He's Dude. done so many different types of roles. He's yeah. not afraid to be the guy that's in, you know, thick, thick, heavy makeup for something like Captain Marvel. Uh, not afraid to be in the business suit for something like Ready Player One. Uh, but here, he's, you know, he's fully on board with the Empire. Mm-hmm. He's very yes. assertive. He's he's very, um, what's the word? Uh, he's power ambitious. Hungry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, he's also mincing, though, and he's nervous. And there's just this... Right. underlying anxiety all the time that mm-hmm. you know he's slightly in over his head but he thinks he's got to a good place and then all of a sudden there's something he didn't think of and he's just constantly sort of second guessing and you know you can just see the inner workings going on with the stuff that Ben Mendelssohn does mm-hmm. just with his eyes or just how he looks at certain people and it's a wonderful wonderful performance throughout uh, the entire time you just know that the the building of the Death Star, the completion, it's it's never going to be fully in his hands mm-hmm. because of how he handles himself. And yeah. uh, people like Darth Vader and Grand yeah. Moff Tarkin are going to take full advantage of that oh, and for take sure. it all away from him, which is his ultimate downfall. Yeah, Grand Moff Tarkin, too. And all, all of these... Um these imperial officers and everything uh in in the book the catalyst a lot of them didn't want galen urso to come on board they're like well he doesn't really have the allegiance towards us and he doesn't he's not political or anything like that we can't really trust him he was actually he, he befriended his captors during the clone wars as well and so they they didn't trust him and and galen galen urso really didn't want any part of it as well. But Orson Krennic really pushed for him to be on the project. Like he was, he, he pushed for him because he was like, he's the only one that can get this done, design this laser ray. And if you guys don't know, and if it wasn't spelled out as clearly to you in Rogue One, the Kyber crystals are, the, are what powers the Death Star and what yeah. create that awesome force that destroys planets. And so- they're mining out of Jeddah, right? Yep, out of Jeddah and around the galaxy. There's lots of places. And one of the reasons why they were able to accumulate all that kyber crystals was because after the downfall of the Jedi, the Jedi um, kept the secrets about where the kyber crystals were. They, this was a, a thing that only the Jedi knew about, and they didn't tell anybody else. It was, it was in the vaults as well. But all that was released after the fall of the Jedi. And so the Empire was able to find all these places and, and start to call all of this all this kyber crystal and bring it all together so they needed massive kyber crystals and galen Urso was brought on board to study this and to figure out a way to power this 
Well, it was a, a great cast all around. You know, mm-hmm. it's an ensemble cast here, which we get a, just a really basic version of that feeling with the original trilogy. You've got three, four, four possible uh, main characters, maybe five if you include mm-hmm. like C-3PO and R2-D2 Chewbacca. But as far as human characters go, you've got Luke, Han, mm-hmm. Leia, and Lando. And uh, here we have a plethora of others, and they all yep. kind of hold a balanced amount of screen time. They all have individual side stories that just fit together very nicely, mm-hmm. and everybody's got their moments to shine. And yeah. uh, I, I think that makes this feel a little bit more like the war film of the Star Wars Absolutely. Uh, franchise. And that's what and, they were aiming for, kind of a Vietnam-era yeah. Star Wars film as well. Cool. And let's talk, bringing it back to Andor as well, let's talk about Genevieve O'Reilly. We do get to see her in this as Mon yeah. Mothma. And <laughs> so I felt very much attached to that character a lot more than I was the first time that I watched this and seeing how serious and somber she was. And then finally, like when uh, they leave for Scarif and everything and Ad- Admiral Raditz um, takes his fleet off, you see that little smile, that glimmer of hope in in Mon Mothma. And that was just, that paid off so much. Just knowing what that character has gone through in season one. Yeah. I'm sure she's going to go through a lot too in season two, but it really haircut, did enrich. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's the only thing that we got that's from her is a, is a nice little stylish haircut. She when does the collar that, and yeah. now the hair is going next. Yeah. That's the big burning question. When does she get the Mon Mothma haircut yeah. in season two? Uh, but really, yeah, it, that so it did very much uh, make that character all the more special all these layers that we get to see in all these characters so i really do think let's let's bring it back to the the beginning premise that i i presented to us at the beginning of this episode i really do think that andor improved rogue one what do you think brother i think i mean for me it it increased the the excitement yeah um as I was watching Rogue One, um, I, I was very aware of the pacing differences immediately. Oh, um, me too. And not just because we're going from show mm-hmm. to film, but um, because of the amount of time that was spent on ca- character development with Andor. Can't possibly be done that way in Rogue One. Uh, but I do feel like there could have been more. Uh, but mm-hmm. this is still a two-hour movie. Yeah, it and is. So you can't cram it much more no. full than what it was already uh, and risk having pacing problems. And one thing that I don't think the movie suffered with at all, at least from my opinion, is pacing. I love the way that this movie is paced. I do too. It felt very much like the originals mm-hmm. and that there's just something always going on. And then, oh, go, go, we got to get to the next thing. And yep. oh, man, now there's a trash compactor. Yeah. And oh, no, you know, we can't yeah. get away from the tractor beam. All sorts of stuff just randomly happening. There's snakes that are actually caves or caves that are actually snakes. It, it's just something to deal with constantly. Mm-hmm. And that's what happens in this movie, too. And I, I like that pacing for Me a too. Star Wars movie at all. It keeps that swashbuckly Flash mm-hmm. Gordon Saturday morning serial feel mm-hmm. going. It's um, absolutely refreshing to me, too. Yeah. And I very much enjoyed that pacing, too. And it kind of leads me to wonder... Um, if we could have had a more tight knit, better paced season one of Andor as well, yeah. What do you and, think? Well, and I, I I thought about that. That's really what I thought about the most. Mm-hmm. Moving from Andor into Rogue One is could they have tightened it up? I, I liked it so much the way it was paced and that it felt uh, novelistic. It it felt uh, so much more detailed and yeah. it felt like a story that needed to be told on a longer timeline. Um, So I I really appreciated that about Andor. Um, So I don't know. I'm fine with both how they are. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I don't know that Andor really changed my opinion much of Rogue One. Honestly, I I loved the movie before and I loved it really just as much afterwards. Mm -hmm. So I think about my wife who has not seen Andor 
and uh, has seen Rogue One, and she really liked it. I don't know if it would change her perspective much of it either. I mm-hmm. thought maybe I would feel a little bit differently about Andor, but I I think we got enough um, uh, of his character and, and little bits of development there in Rogue One for me to feel something for when mm-hmm. his character ultimately meets his end uh, yeah. at the end of the movie. So I don't know. It felt it, complete. It, uh, and I felt like yeah. Marva was there too. I felt like, you know, especially like at the end too. And I mentioned yeah. this in Andor when he, when Andor found out that Marva had passed away, he looked out onto the ocean. And again, yeah, that like watching Rogue One, that absolutely mirrors the end of his storyline looking out on the ocean with Jen. And he says, yeah, your father true. would be proud of you. The only thing like I felt in that moment was like, oh man, so would your parents. So would your right. Cliff. So would Marva. He would, they would be absolutely proud of you. And what they have done, they would be so proud of what you have done, Andor. So it, it did yeah. bring a lot more emotional weight to that scene and the character as a whole. So as far as enhancing and improving the, the viewing of this, it definitely did. It it made me more invested in Rogue One, so I very much feel like it helped a lot with, yeah. with this. Movie. For me, rating of Rogue One would have stayed the same before yeah. and after. Endor. It's almost a, a moot point to to rate this one, I, and I'll we'll we'll just go. We can go into our ratings right now. But for me, ten out of ten. Like this is my absolute favorite of the Disney Star Wars films. What about you, brother? <laughs> I actually have to rate it a nine out of ten, and I'll tell you the whole oh, reason. Oh, why. damn! <laughs> uh, Controversy. Nothing to do with the fight. actors and actresses. I, I mm-hmm, loved mm-hmm. Felicity Jones in this. Diego Luna, the whole cast. Mm-hmm. Okay, they all did a, a great, great job. I love hit me, hit me that <laughs> this is the Star Wars movie where we got a real, real push. Yep. for diversity, like absolutely. There was just, oh, in so the many- aliens too. Holy crap, yeah. we actually got a diverse cast of aliens. And kind of like, yeah. and this is something we were also missing in Andor as well. We didn't have that right. diverse cast of a- aliens. But again, I think season two is going to vastly improve that because these alliance, the, the Rebel Alliance is going to come together and coalesce. And that is a, a lot of diverse individuals and aliens and characters that we're going wow. to see moving forward. So that, for me, Rogue One actually made me wish certain things about Andor more than the opposite. So in a I way, was say in a way. the, uh, <laughs> the inclusion of the diverse cast of both humans and aliens. And the fact that the creators of rogue one loved star Wars so much that they went and they actually got some original costumes yeah. from the original trilogy. Mm-hmm. They got those alien costumes, put people back into them. And it just paid so much attention to the details of things like Darth Vader's costume from New Hope replicated it here. They did all of this great stuff Mm -hmm. to honor Star Wars. But the one thing they did. Here it comes. Here it comes. Yep. And you might know what I'm going to say, but for some reason, they did not give it the opening that Star Wars movies (laughs) deserve to have. I, I for one, at do you want to not the, like the, full the opening thing. of this movie. Just all yeah. of a sudden, a long time ago, it sets it up. The same. It yeah. even got that in a Star Wars film, when they say a long time ago, Galaxy Far, Far Away, there's always four periods at the end of that little intro in every single Star Wars. But there's four periods here, too. They got even that little detail. But then it just goes, bleh, mm-hmm. and nothing. And we get the same space, spaceship, planet, pan that we get in all Star Wars films. But we get no opening crawl Mm -hmm. for some reason. I I couldn't stand it. And we don't (laughs) actually get to even see the title of the film until, you know, this sort of cold open that happens. And I really felt, from my opinion, that it was very disjointed. I was wondering, like, Hmm. why? Why did they do that? So I looked into it. Yeah. A, a little bit more. And um, originally, one of the writers, his name is Gary Witta. He wrote in his first draft, an opening crawl. In every subsequent draft after that, 
it was removed and it wasn't yet talked about whether or not there was going to be one. Mm -hmm. It was just an idea. Maybe we'll have one, maybe we won't. But there originally was one and we'll never actually get to see what that was because he's not going to release it. Uh, there have been fans that have come along and written their own. Okay. Um, and it was decided ultimately between Gareth Edwards and the rest of the creative team that they would not open with a crawl because they said that a Rogue One, Rogue One was taken from the opening crawl of New Hope. And so in order to show more attachment <laughs> to that movie, there would be no opening crawl here. Um, and to me, that's just not that great of a reason. That's mm. what Star Wars fans are expecting every film to open with. And if you're not going to do that, do something else that opens us up in a way that isn't jarring. Don't just blast a bunch of brass horns and mm -hmm. you know show empty space. That doesn't make sense for a Star Wars movie. Well, but. yeah, it wasn't as big of an issue for me, um, the, the opening of this, because I think that the intent was to differentiate this from the main saga. They wanted to have something special that happened for the main saga. You get the Star Wars opening crawl for our main episodic uh, movies that we have here, episodes one, one through nine. And But now they're stuck. What are so, they going to do for every movie that comes out after? Well, if they're anthology, well, like the original plan for this was an anthology. We had Solo as well, kind yeah. of went along with the same thing as well. And we were going to have Boba Fett. That was going to be the third, right. third one in this anthology movie series. These separate movies that were on the sides of the main Star Wars saga. So they wanted to be able to show you that, hey, this is a side story. It's not actually a part of the the main saga that we're showing you. It's extra stuff. So you can kind of lop this in with the Star Wars shows that we're getting as well. Those also don't have main crawls and crawls or anything like that um, as right. well. So all this other material, it's extra. It's stuff that enhances what we're going to see in the main saga of, of Star Wars, the Skywalker saga. But don't you think that something like um, Clone Wars those openings that are there don't you think it sets itself apart yeah and that's different too i mean they go meanwhile right. in this this sector <laughs> and right they... but exactly so you have something mm -hmm. but this and solo they, they don't have yeah. anything that really you know introduces yeah. us to the movie we just kind of get going with the well the solo they do there. they um they kind of it's a period of dark dark times and they have they have like a statement that's in the blue font at the beginning of yeah. solo yeah this one they don't even do that i i just i like just getting into the story like that i thought the visuals were really impressive with the rings around that planet how they showed that with the light and the darkness and mm -hmm. and the ship coming in to that planet uh to, to find gail and her so i very much enjoyed all of those shots so that's all i needed and I, I was in i was i was ready to go so yeah so gareth personal Edward preference himself uh comes from a visual effects background in his career and you can and tell. that's why yeah yeah movies like this and godzilla have such a realistic look to mm -hmm. them uh, because there's a lot of attention to detail in these Absolutely. effects and i gotta say this to me the effects here were perfect Mm -hmm. I mean, you really just can't make it look any better than what was there. And again, this movie comes out in 2016. We're here now in 2022, almost 23. Yeah. Looking at this and finding the effects very, very realistic, flawless yeah. compared to all sorts of movies that are out today. Definitely right. compared to the originals and I, I are the uh, the prequels and I'd say the sequels. I, I think Rogue One looks better than them too. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Rogue One looks far and beyond better than than the sequel trilogy that we got. Absolutely, yeah. and I don't know why that is. I think that it was just yeah, like you said, Gareth Edwards came from that school and uh, had paid attention to detail, and that is beautifully done. And the passion was there, you know, and the yeah. love for this project. So, just because that was such a heartbreaker for me, 9 out of 10. Heartbreaker! Oh, man. It <laughs> took him down a whole point, guys. Um, so, 
that's probably going to be it for us. We're, we're kind of going, going long on this one, but we will be back and revisit Rogue One again here after Andor Season 2. It was fun to get to review Andor with you, brother. I'm so glad that we did. I'm glad that we got to use this episode to kind of wrap up all those things. And my very last thing that I want to, to bring up before we get out of here is you asked me the question on when the Death Star 2 was uh, they started construction oh, yes. i found this information out for you so they Woo! actually started constructing that right um when the first death star was destroyed so it can't possibly be the the second death star in andor that we see um emperor palpatine actually commissioned that right before it was destroyed and i was wondering i was like and they haven't explicitly said it but maybe he had an intuition that something would happen to it it was designed as a bigger battle station as well. So it's much larger and it takes less time for the, the reactors to power up so they can actually shoot and destroy things more and more precisely with the second Death Star. So it's DS2 was that one. So, so where did they get the plans? Where did they get the plans? So, yeah. So, um, well, they were archived. So that was that was the thing is, you know, they had the designers still. And they said in like in the information that I was looking up, there was... There was the main architect of of the Death Star, not Galen Erso, but the main architect that worked on the first Death Star. They actually cloned him and had oh. him working on the second Death Star. So so they brought him back to life. There's still were clones all over the place, man. So they brought yeah. him back to life to work on that Death Star. So I guess that's the explanation that you get. So gotcha. Okay. All right. Do we have anything else? Any other tidbits before we depart out of here and hyperdrive on I out? Yeah, I've got my closing tidbit. Do uh, it. So we're throwing them out there. Um, do you know where the name Scarif came from? No, but I'm scared to ask. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of crazy. So uh, Gareth Edwards was at Starbucks, and as is uh, uh, just a giant Gareth? joke now for oh. anybody that's been <laughs> to Starbucks and ordered something, they got his Miss name wrong when they wrote it scared. on the cup. And they wrote Scarith instead of Gareth. And so from there... <laughs> How do you go it from it? <laughs> Gareth to Scarith? Is Scarith even a name? Like It is not a name. <laughs> but I think some of those baristas just do it on purpose just to be funny. <laughs> that, that, they had to have. So. Wow. Okay. Yep. <laughs> that's all i've got brother <laughs> perfect so all right guys i'm glad that you guys joined us here if you haven't already subscribe to our channel like this uh like this video we really appreciate all your support we celebrate every new subscription that we have i think we're at 162 new Woo! subscribers now so we really want to get to a thousand if we get to a thousand we're going to design fun fatherly fandom hats and give out a hundred of those for free to some of our subscribers we'll do like a a little lottery or a little draw out of the hat or whatnot for you guys and send them on out to you so please help us get to that goal and uh if you want to listen to this we have a podcast now on spotify apple podcast amazon music all the places that you can listen to podcasts we're up there so go ahead and listen to us there and from our families to yours have a good one and may the force be with you